that uh, <clears throat> time of communion is a special time, isn't it? You know, when I um, am sitting uh, taking communion, I, I typically, because I'm part of all three services, uh, not only do I take s- communion every Sunday with, uh, along with the rest of you, I often take it three times on a Sunday. And uh, that can get dangerously close to putting you at risk of it losing its significance. Uh, and just a side note, this isn't even on my notes. I wanted to share with you, when I take communion, something that I do to make it special. You know, when I, I take that bread and I put it in my mouth and that first bite into that bread, uh, in my mind, I allow that to represent the time that I, all the times that I, I break Jesus' heart. I, I break his flesh through my sin. And then kind of as a, an encouraging afterthought is the, the blood of Christ that covers for my sin. And you'll notice if you ever watch me take communion, I often, I will drink the, the juice and you'll see me raise a glass uh, to my Savior who offered that, that gift to me. What an awesome, awesome time together. You know, worshiping with you all on a Sunday morning is a special blessing. Uh, God has blessed us with some incredible musicians and to lead us in worship. What an incredible time together, right, this morning? Awesome. Um, yeah, we are, we're in week two of a, of a summer series called Running with Giants. And the idea behind Running with Giants is, is simple. It's, it's this idea that comes out of Hebrews uh, chapter 12, verse 1. Let me share the verse with you. It says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. So in this, in this verse, you have a word picture, right? We talked about this last week, that you and I, if we have committed our lives to following Christ, we are on a track, if you will. We are running a race uh, for, for the sake of, of God's purpose in our life. We're running this race that He's called us to run. And in the stands on all sides of us are this huge crowd of witnesses cheering us on. And I love this picture because it reminds us that as you are running your own race, there are people who have already ran this race and they have since passed away and they are now experiencing God's glory forever. But at at the same time, somehow, they are witnesses to the race that you and I are running. That we are surrounded by giants of the faith who have run this race before us. Now as you look up into the stands, you're going to notice some familiar faces from God's word. You're going to notice some people, you're like, wow, I, I don't really know that guy. Uh, but next to him, you're going to say, oh my goodness, there's, there's Joseph. We talked about Joseph last week. And here's the greatest part, though, is that we're going to ask some of these giants from the faith. Specifically today, we're going to, we're going to skip over the New Testament, and we're going to ask John the Baptist to come out of the stands and to come and coach us as we're running our own race. Now, here's, here's a thought. If you were going to ask someone to coach you, you probably would want to make sure that they knew what they were doing, right? I'm not going to ask uh, you know, someone who's never played basketball to coach me in basketball. It wouldn't make any sense. Like They, they wouldn't have any true wisdom to offer me. I'm not going to ask uh, my friend who is bankrupt and all of their accounts are in the negative to provide any financial advice to me. That doesn't make any sense. So we have to ask ourselves, does John the Baptist have the references to actually speak truth into my life and to yours? Does he have what it takes to really be the guy who we ought to have coaching us as we're running this race? Here's the best part. Imagine for a moment you're going in for a job interview, and the the person interviewing you, if they're doing their job well, they're going to ask you for references, right? You're going to talk yourself up. You're going to tell them how you're great and that you're the perfect person for the job. But they, what they want to know is, would other people say the same things about you that you're saying about you? So they want references. And in this moment, you imagine you ask John the Baptist. He's walking down. He's coming down. He's, he's wanting to whisper truth into my ear as I'm running this race. And I ask him, I say, John, uh, what are your references Check this out. John has one of the greatest, the greatest reference of all time. I was going to say one of. This is not one of the greatest references of all time. This is the 
greatest reference of all time. Imagine for a moment if in that job interview you were able to slant, uh, 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 slide over your resume and on it as a reference was Jesus. Wouldn't that be great? If they could then call Jesus and have Jesus say, yeah, he's absolutely the best guy for the job. That would be the best reference ever. And in this moment, if we're checking John's credentials, this is what Jesus says about him in Matthew chapter 11. Listen to this. This is amazing. I tell you the truth. All right, so Jesus is telling the truth. He doesn't know how to lie. I tell you the truth of all who have ever lived. None is greater than John the Baptist. Boom, done. Hang up the phone. That's the only reference you will ever need. If you're wondering whether or not John the Baptist has the authority to speak wisdom into your life, Jesus has said that no one is better than John the Baptist. What an incredible thing to be true about your life, right? When we, uh, about three months ago, we, we use this tool on staff here at ACC called Slack. Has anyone heard of Slack? Raise your hand if you've heard of Slack. Just a few. Uh, okay, the people that use it are with our church. Okay, good. Well, anyway, we use this tool, and it is a, it's basically a group texting tool. So instead of having to send a, uh, an actual text where you're only limited to 10 people, you can communicate with a whole team of people all at one time. And on this Slack channel, I, uh, there was a conversation going on, and somebody said something, and then I noticed that somebody reacted to the thing with an emoji of a goat. And I was like, I, what, what does this mean? I, I assume they pressed the wrong button. They were probably going for like the happy face or the thumbs up and somehow they hit the goat button instead. But then I start noticing that other people on staff are also hitting the goat. I'm like, am I missing something? And then the next day there's another Slack message and somebody hits the goat again. I'm thinking, am I outside of an inside joke? So I, I reach out to my staff. I say, hey, forgive me if this is stupid, but... What does the goat mean? And I know that you guys all, there's, there's a few of you in this room right now that know what the goat means. In the count of three, go ahead and just say it out loud. One, two, three. Uh, greatest of all time, and somebody yelled Tom Brady. I, okay. Um, so GOAT, right, it's an acronym for greatest of all time, G-O-A-T. There's a debate right now, right, about whether or not LeBron James or Michael Jordan is the real GOAT. Who's the greatest of all time? Well, let me tell you really clearly. If Jesus were trying to communicate this reference about John the Baptist right now to us using today's technology, I think it would have looked like this. I tell you the truth of all who have ever lived, none is greater than John the Baptist, hashtag goat. Now here's the problem I see about this. In the Bible, right, there's, there's sheep and there's goats. And the Bible, in those, in those parables, right, you don't want to be a goat. The goat is bad. But in this case, I think, uh, because it's in all caps, I think what Jesus would be communicating with us is, listen, John the Baptist, without a doubt, of all who have ever lived, greatest of all time. That's a pretty cool reference. So the question is, should we listen to anything John the Baptist would say to us? Absolutely, we should. And what would this goat, what would John the Baptist say to you? You hire him on, you're saying, John, absolutely, Joseph is here coaching you now, and John the Baptist is standing next to you. Remember, Joseph saying, don't quit, don't quit, don't quit. That's what Joseph, that's kind of his big motto. That's what he keeps reminding you. John the Baptist, I think what he would say to you is this, believer, Run well. Run well. There is a way to run and there is a way not to run. I want to teach you how to run the right way. I want you to run well. Let me give you a little bit of background about John the Baptist. Uh, John the Baptist, uh, he was a PK, which stands for a pastor's kid. Any other PKs in here? Uh, any PKs? Anyone who grew up like in, we got a, we got a one PK? All right, so that's a kind of a special situation already, right? When you're a PK, so we know that John the Baptist's dad, Zechariah, was a priest. So he was like a priest kid, right? So he grew up, he understood like the church, he understood how the, the laws worked and how, uh, what you could and couldn't do in the temple. Like John the Baptist was, was part of this situation. His mom was Elizabeth. Elizabeth happens to be the cousin of Mary, the mother of Jesus. 
So Elizabeth and Mary are family. That's kind of cool. And uh, so we have this, this background a little bit. But before John the Baptist was even born, uh, Zechariah and Elizabeth had been praying over and over and over again for a baby. They wanted God to bless them with a child, and they had been praying all the way up until uh, they basically realized that they weren't able to have children, and they were too old now to have children, so they had given up on the idea of having children. But then, after a silence of 400 years, you know, Malachi, the end of the Old Testament, all the way to the New Testament, God hasn't communicated with his people, hasn't communicated with the earth through a prophet, through an angel, in any sort of way, total silence, finally, the silence is broken by an angel visiting Zechariah. And the angel says, <laughs> this is crazy, God has heard your prayers. Think about this for a moment. If Zechariah and Elizabeth are old, too old to have children and have never had any children, I doubt this is a prayer they were still praying. I don't think at night uh, Zechariah and Elizabeth gathered around their bed and they got on their knees and they said, God, please still bless us with a child. This is a prayer they used to pray. This is something they used to ask for and it never was answered the way they wanted. And now they're too old to have children. They've given up on the idea of having children and an angel comes and says, you are gonna have a son and his name is gonna be John the Baptist and he has a really cool purpose. It is so unbelievable that, John, or that Zechariah doesn't even believe it and he ends up getting in trouble for not believing the angel. But get this, the, the, the opening statement that says, the Lord has heard your prayers. Total side note here for a moment, you might be praying for something right now that you think you need and you want right now in your life and it might not be 40 years until God says, hey, I heard your prayer. I want to give that to you now. So little freebie. All right, let's get back to what we're talking about. So here's uh, the first thing I think John the Baptist would say, uh, not just run well, he would say run with purpose. In other words, you have to understand, in order to run well, you have to understand why you're running. You have to understand what the purpose of all this is about. Why are you circling around this track over and over again? What is the purpose of the running? If you understand your purpose, you'll be able to run well. And one thing that's a little bit unfair about uh, John the Baptist is when the angel visited Zechariah before John the Baptist was even a thought, a twinkle in his parents' eye, right? Before he was even conceived, in that moment, John the Baptist already had a purpose because the angel told his dad what his purpose was. And we see this in Luke chapter 1. It says, And he will turn many Israelites to the Lord their God. He will be a man with the spirit and power of Elijah. And then get this, He will prepare the people for the coming of the Lord. Now, it sounds a little unfair. In, in a moment, think about this for, for a second. If you're a parent in this room, imagine if while you were pregnant, an angel of the Lord came and told you the exact and explicit purpose of your child's life. Wouldn't that be awesome? Like right now, we're trying to figure out, hey, should we do more dance or should we spend more time on piano? Do, should they learn Spanish? Like we're, uh, we're trying to like make decisions for, our, you know, what's the best for our kids and what, what is God leading them to and trying to prepare them. It would just be awesome if God would just come and say, this one's going to do that, this one's going to do that, and this one's going to do that. Perfect. All right. So now I know what to do, right? Zechariah had this privilege, an angel telling him, this is what your son's purpose in life is going to be. He is going to prepare the way for the Lord in the lives of people. Now here's a, a crazy truth about that. That was specifically John the Baptist's purpose. That was vocationally what he was going to dedicate his life to as a job was to this purpose. But the truth is, I know for a fact that that purpose is also a purpose that's been given to me in my life. I know that that purpose is one that's been given to my wife and my kids in their lives. I know that that purpose, preparing the way for the Lord in the lives of other people, is something that God has called every single one of us to do. 
You see, in, in Matthew 28, where we have the Great Commission, right? When God tells us what he wants us to do before he, he goes back into heaven, he says, I want you to go out into all the world teaching people about Jesus and baptizing people and then teaching them to love and obey God. This Great Commission, this is not a great suggestion. This is a great commission. It's a great command. It's something that all of us are called to do. You and I, listen, are called to prepare the way for Jesus in the lives of other people. You and I don't save people. I don't get up here and say some prayer and be like, yeah, I saved a bunch of people this morning. No, that never happens. What happens is, you know, by getting up here on the stage and by doing what God's vocationally called me to do, what I hope to do, my goal is to prepare your heart, prepare the way for God to do what God is gonna do in your life. I can't do anything apart from Christ, right? So the goal, listen, in your life is to run with purpose. And John the Baptist is wanting you to know the purpose he had for his life is also the purpose you have in your life. Listen, when you, when you uh, invite a neighbor to church, you're preparing the way for the Lord to work in their life. When you go and share the gospel with someone at work, you are preparing their heart for God to do what he's gonna do. When you call up a parent on the phone who doesn't know Jesus and you, and you pray with them and you tell them of the good news of what God's done in your life, you're preparing the way for God to work in their life. When you open the door, when you're a host at, in the host ministry here and you open the door for someone as they're walking into church, you are preparing the way for Jesus to work in their life this morning. When you are in the nursery holding someone's baby, you are allowing them to come into this room distraction-free and you are preparing the way for Jesus to work in their life this morning. You are teaching a little baby about the love of Jesus and preparing the way for Jesus to work in their life. When you are working in any area of ministry, when you are doing anything within this church, when you are generous with your giving, you are preparing the way for Jesus to work in the lives of other people. Dads, when you, when you set a good example at home and you love your wife well and you take her out on dates and you treat her like a queen, you are preparing the way for Christ, not only in her life, but in the lives of your children. Moms, when you when you spend time praying over your children and writing them encouraging notes and, and teaching them God's word, and when you do what, what you do best, you are preparing the way for Jesus to work in their life. Listen, every single person in this room, John wants you to know to run with purpose. Another thing I think John would want you to know is to run with humility. Have you ever seen uh, one of those videos where someone is running a race and they seem to be so far ahead of second place that as they're getting close to the finish line, they start celebrating a little too early and as they slow down to celebrate or they spike the football and they actually are like two yards before the touchdown line and they just get a little excited a little too soon and then somebody passes them at the last moment and they end up losing the race. These are like these last, if you go onto YouTube, search uh, celebration fails. Early celebration fails. And you will see uh, 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 t- people who are getting to the finish line of the race that they're running and they are drawing attention to themselves. That's what they're doing. They're, they're, just in this last Olympics, there was one of our, one of our uh, speed snowboarders and she was r- totally had won this race and at the very last hill she decides to do a trick. And as she goes up, she's, you know, kicking her, just to kind of like make a point, like not only did I win this thing, but I'm going to win it with every eye on me, like with whatever, I'm going to do some cool thing. And she ends up falling and losing the race. Listen, when we run our races, it should never be with the intention of drawing attention to ourselves. We don't want to go out and run around this track so that people look at us. We don't want to wear some flashy, you know, track suit so people are like, oh, wow, look at that guy. We want to run this race not only with purpose, but with humility pointing people to Christ. And John the Baptist knew exactly what this looked like. We see uh, one, one way he was humble was in his appearance. Check this out. It says in Matthew 3, 4 that John's clothes were woven from coarse camel hair and he wore a leather belt around his waist. This guy was not into the latest fashion, okay? It says for food he ate locusts and wild honey. 
You're going to see here in a moment that John the Baptist had built quite a name for himself. He was famous, if you will, for the time. Everyone knew of John the Baptist. He easily could have taken his fame and, and figured out a way to monetize it. He could have worn something a lot nicer. He could have had a place to live instead of living out in the wilderness. He could have cared about those things, but John the Baptist said, no, 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 listen. Run with humility. Don't care about your appearance or about what other people think about you. And then we see in the next two verses, it says, people from Jerusalem and all of Judea and all over the Jordan Valley. So listen, basically what this is saying is people from all over the place were traveling far and wide. They went out to see and hear John. So was John basically a pretty famous guy for his time? It sounds like it. It says, and then, and when they confessed their sins, he baptized them in the Jordan River. Here's a couple observations about this verse regarding humility. One, he was also humble in his service. You know, once you've built a name for yourself, it would have been really easy for John to say, all right, you, you, and you, you guys are my followers. You guys now are going to get into that muddy water. You guys are going to deal with all these sinners. You guys do the baptizing. I'm going to just sit back over here and just, I, I, I did my time. I don't need to do that anymore. Listen, John the Baptist was humble in his service. He was willing to get into the water. He was willing to get into the mess of people's lives. He was willing to get real with people in that moment. And John showed just great humility in that. But what we also see is that as he was building a name, he wasn't building a name for himself, but as a name was being built around him, as people knew of John the Baptist, people started really thinking like, man, this guy is the man. He is, he's, uh, we came all this way for him. And then what John the Baptist says is this, Matthew 3.11, he says, I baptize with water those who repent of their sins and turn to God. But someone is coming who is greater than I am, so much greater that I am not worthy even to be his slave and carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Listen, you've never met a proud person who will admit that someone is better than them. Pride uh, it keeps you from, from being able to point people to someone else. But in this moment, there was no pride in John the Baptist. He had a, plenty of excuses and reasons to be proud of kind of the, the following he had built. But instead of, of using it for, to make his, his own name great, he said, listen, everyone who's looking at me right now, look, look here. Everyone who's looking here, don't look here. Look over here. Jesus is where you ought to put your attention. I'm not even worthy to, to carry this guy's sandals. That is incredible humility. So John wants you to know, listen, I want you to run with purpose and I want you to, to run with humility. This, this overall idea, John 3.30 says this. This is a different John, but what, what he says is he must become greater and greater. I must become less and less. So Christian, listen. When you walk into a room when you go to work tomorrow, when you walk into a, a place where you, you're going to know somebody and you walk into that space, there are two ways in that moment that you can respond in that situation. One of the ways is like this. You ready? Here I am. Or you can walk into a space where instead of here I am, you get more of a there you are. See, in your life, you have the ability to respond. You, you, can, you can decide to, to care about here I am, to, to, to go into a space and to draw attention to yourself and to make people want to see you and for everything to be all about you. Or you can walk in other people's lives and say, there you are. There he is. Point people to Christ. Number three, I think John would say this. Believer, run with boldness. This is one of my favorite parts of this story. In Matthew 3, uh, we see that as all the people were gathering to be baptized, there were Pharisees and Sadducees who were also gathering to watch what was happening. Now the Pharisees and the Sadducees, remember, just kind of out of habit, they never liked it when other people got more attention than they did. So the fact that John the Baptist is getting this attention makes them very uncomfortable. So they show up and John says this to them, but when he saw many Pharisees and Sadducees coming 
to watch him baptize, they, he denounced them. You brood of snakes, he exclaimed, prove by the way you live that you have repented of your sins and turned to God. So basically what's happening is, is the normal folk, the, the you and I, uh, the, the, the people that were just not Pharisees and Sadducees were coming to John. They were genuinely repenting of their sin, genuinely recognizing a need for Christ, and John was taking them into the water and baptizing them. The Pharisees, on the other hand, were full of pride. They thought their lives were all together. They didn't think they had anything to repent of, and their lives did not match the lifestyle that a follower of Christ would have been living. So John said to them with total boldness, listen, you brood of snakes. Until you can start living a life that reflects caring about Christ, until you can be repentant of your sin, then you don't really belong getting baptized into repentance. He was bold with his faith. And I want to encourage us with this verse to be bold as well. Romans 1.16 says this, For I am not ashamed of this good news about Christ. It is the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes, the Jew first and also the Gentile. So here's the, here's the, the truth from this verse. If John the Baptist we're coaching you right now. You're running this race and he's telling you to run well. He's telling you, make sure you run with purpose and make sure you run with humility uh, you know, and make sure you're running with boldness. The boldness comes across like this. As you run, don't be ashamed of what you're running for. Don't be ashamed to be on Christ's track running this race for him. Don't care what anybody else thinks don't be afraid to call out things that need to be called out. Listen, believer, when you are running this race, run with boldness. And then another thing, the fourth and final thing I think John would tell us in our quest for learning how to run well is to run with confidence. Here's what's interesting about this. The first three things John the Baptist was teaching uh, from experience. In other words, I, I, I ran with purpose, so I want to teach you that. I, I ran with humility, so I want to now show you how I did that. I, I ran, you know, with boldness. Let me, let me talk to you about that. This last one is a little different. Have you ever noticed that sometimes the best way to learn a lesson, unfortunately, is learning it the hard way? You know what I'm talking about? Those lessons where you now know to tell someone else, hey, make sure you run with confidence because you can point back at a spot in your life where you didn't do that and you saw the consequences of it? Listen what happens. This is a part of John the Baptist's story that often goes uh, overlooked. You see, John had no reason. If there was ever a person that had no excuse for doubt, it was John the Baptist. We even see that there's, there's a point in Scripture in Luke chapter 1 that as Elizabeth is pregnant with John the Baptist and Mary is pregnant with Jesus, when Mary is speaking about Christ, that John the Baptist, it says, leaps for joy in his mom. Listen, John the Baptist knew the truth about Jesus before he was even born. John the Baptist had no reason to doubt Christ. In fact, when John the Baptist was baptizing Jesus and Jesus comes back out of the water, it says the heavens opened, God's spirit descended in the form of a dove, landed on Jesus, and then God said, this is my son. Listen, if you have ever experienced anything like that, if God, you watched God point at something and audibly say from the sky, this is true, there is no reason whatsoever to, to doubt it, right? John the Baptist watched this happen. There is no reason whatsoever for him to doubt whether or not Jesus is Jesus. And yet, the goat, the greatest of all time, in a season of his life, found himself doubting Christ. You might have missed this. Let me, let me read it to you. Matthew 11. It says, when John, this is John the Baptist, who was in prison, heard the words, or heard about the deeds of the Messiah. In other words, he, he's been watching, he's been hearing stories about Jesus healing people and freeing people from, from you know, 
emotional prisons and, and freeing them from, from sin and, and, and disease and sickness. He's hearing all these stories about how Jesus is, is kind of freeing people. He's like, I'm, I'm sitting here, Jesus, in prison. What about me? Like, he must have been thinking in that moment, why does Jesus, why has he forgotten me? And he says, he sent his disciples to ask him, are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? Can you imagine how much doubt must have been processing through John's head at that moment to, to actually have gotten to the point where he's like, have I been running on the wrong track? Have I been running for the wrong guy? This whole thing, all this I've gone through, I've been bold, so bold now that I'm here in prison, I'm about to lose my life. Am I about to lose my life for the wrong guy? And he's, he's sitting there actually processing these thoughts. And he sends his disciples to go figure out the answer to this question. And here's what I want, I want to leave you. Here's my so what for you. If you have ever experienced doubt in your faith, I want to encourage you with a few things. Number one, you're in the company of John the Baptist, the greatest of all time. Apart from Christ. John the Baptist experienced doubt too. So I want to encourage you with three things that from experience I think John the Baptist would want to say to you in your moment of doubt. Number one is this, expect doubt. Listen, there are going to be seasons of your life where things aren't going exactly the way you want them to go or where Christ seems distant and for whatever reason it's just not making sense. Uh, your relationship doesn't, he doesn't, you don't feel the tingle you once felt. And in those moments of your faith, you're going to doubt whether or not Christ is real. I want you to know, because we see the greatest of all time, John the Baptist experienced this as well, expect it. Expect that it's going to happen. Especially, if you want to put another little dot on your note, especially when you are weak and alone. Because we notice when John the Baptist experienced this doubt is when he's sitting weak and alone in prison there's probably a whole lesson in there if you can find ways in your faith to not be alone to be surrounded by other believers in a life group or in community in a church of people who encourage you when you find yourself weak you're probably going to experience less doubt but listen you will experience doubt another thing I think John would want you to know from his experience and this one's my favorite is when you have doubt Go to Jesus with it. You notice what, what John the Baptist did in this moment of doubt, in this moment of wondering whether or not Jesus was the one that they were really waiting for. He, here's what he doesn't do. He doesn't go, uh, he doesn't do what maybe I would do in this moment. He doesn't go to social media and tell everyone and, and seek advice from other people on what should I do in this moment of doubt. He doesn't go, he doesn't call up his, his, his parents. He doesn't call up uh, you know, his friends. He, 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 in this moment, he, he goes to one person for the answer. He tells his disciples who are on the outside of the prison, go and ask Jesus. So the encouragement here is this. When you find yourself in a season of doubt in your own faith, Go to God with it. Go to Christ with your doubt. And my favorite truth here that John would, would remind you and whisper in your ears, number three, is this idea. Jesus answers doubt with reminders of his goodness and grace. In other words, when you go to him and you ask him, Jesus, is this really, what's, is this really part of your plan? Is this really what you want for my life? In that moment, what he's going to do in your life is what he did for John. Do you see John sent his disciples to go ask Jesus? Jesus, in that moment, he starts uh, healing more people and freeing people from evil spirits. And he's doing all of this incredible work. And then he tells John's disciples, you go back and you tell John what you just saw. So the disciples go back and they tell John and they encourage John, listen, that guy is full of love. Is full of goodness. We watched him working in the lives of other people. We've seen him work in your life. He's been working in our lives. Listen, in those moments where you go to Christ, in those moments of doubt, here's what Jesus is going to say back to you. He's going to remind you of all the good 
and grace He has shown you and all the good and grace He has shown your family. He's going to show you all the good things He's doing in your community and all the ways He's working in the lives of people around you. He is going to remind you of His goodness in those moments. So John would say, listen, believer, run well. Run with purpose. Run with humility. Run with boldness. And learn from my mistake. Run with confidence, knowing that Christ is who Christ says he is. There's a story in in Mark 9. There's a, a, a dad whose son is fighting an evil spirit. He's possessed by an evil spirit. And the dad is desperate. So he goes to Jesus and he says, Jesus, can you please help my son? And Jesus says, do you have faith in me? And the dad says this, and this is a, my so what? This is a prayer I want to teach you so that you can pray this over and over again in your own life. The dad's answer is this very short prayer. He says this, I do believe Help me overcome my unbelief. See, in that moment, I don't believe that John the Baptist doubted who Jesus really was. What he's really saying is, Jesus, I know that you are who you say you are, and that's why I'm going to go to you to get the answer I need, because I know that only you can provide the answer that I need. Jesus, I need your help right now. I need you to help me overcome my unbelief. My favorite part of this story is that after that doubt moment, after the disciples are sent back to John to encourage him, that's when Jesus steps up and says, hey, you know John the Baptist? No one's greater than that guy. Let's pray. God, I ask that you would help us to to go to you. As we're learning to run well, God, that we we can learn to trust you. God, we can learn that you are the, the reason that we do of what we do, that you're the reason that we're on this track and that we are on the right track. God, I pray that you would have us and give us the confidence to to run well, to run with purpose and humility and boldness and confidence. And that when we find ourselves in seasons of doubt, God, we'll say this simple prayer. God, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. God, if there's someone in this room right now who's struggling with with a doubt that they've never actually trusted you as their Savior, that maybe right now they need to say that prayer, God, I, I, there's something in me that says I need to trust you. God, I, I believe. I need you to help me close up the gap. God, I, help me with my unbelief. God, we love you and we thank you for everything you're teaching us and for the example of John the Baptist in our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name.